unclear and all that I can do is wait there is a promise echoing for me Oh what a blessed assurance to know how deeply I'm loved and I'm always reminded that he will be all
All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past Are broken at last I got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord and turn with me to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I, I expect a difficult time this morning. Uh, I've had a difficult time this week trying to prepare this. Uh, so I know Satan's fighting it. Yeah. And so I need you to press through this morning. Yes, sir. I need you to really pray and ask God to open our hearts and open our minds uh, Satan is the arch deceiver. Amen. He's the arch deceiver. I want to preach this morning on the subject of war. Yes. We are at war. Yes, sir. We are at war. I, I think Satan wants to do his best to convince you that there is no war. Right. That, that, that he's, a, he's just a sweet little thing that, that just wants the best for you. But he's a serial killer. Yes, he is. He's a serial killer. And the moment that you signed up for this thing, the moment that you got saved, you entered into a war. Yeah. And I'm, I'm afraid that there's a lot of people in the American church that's losing the heart for war. It's losing the heart for war. And so that's what I want to deal with today. We're going to talk about another man that was struggling with this. And he was losing the heart for war. His name was Timothy. He was a protege of the Apostle Paul, and, and listen, uh, he was the next in line, really. Paul was training him to succeed him and take over for him, and Timothy's having a hard time. He's going through some difficult days and difficult hours, and he's, he's timid, he's afraid, and he's wanting to quit. He's losing the heart for war, and what we're fixing to read is Paul's encouragement to him and warning to him. And so if you're with me this morning in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and, and verse number 1, I want you to say amen. amen. The Bible says, Thou therefore my son. Now keep in mind, keep in mind that the Apostle Paul 
is in the maritime prison in Rome. He is in a, basically a dungeon, a rat hole, uh, waiting to have his head cut off. He's in the last hours and days of his life, but he gets word that his, his son in the faith, Timothy, is, is discouraged. He's ready to quit. He's ready to throw in the towel. Timothy has been left behind in Ephesus to, to lead and be the bishop over the churches there in that area, and he's struggling. He's having a hard time, and so this letter is to Timothy. Timothy. And it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. Endure hardness. That kind of takes away all the teaching and preaching about an easy Christian life. Too blessed to be stressed. I ain't never been that blessed. <laughs> Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a what? Soldier. He says in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. Remember, it's kind of like remember the Alamo or remember Pearl Harbor. It's a war cry. Remember Jesus. He says this in verse 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I am so aware of how desperately I need you in this hour. Lord, I pray that you'll help me help them. Lord, I know we're in a war. I know we're in a fight. Lord, I know that, that Satan, is, is his days are numbered and he's doing everything he can to destroy He's a thief that cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a liar. He's a father of all lies. He's a murderer from the beginning. And Lord, I pray that you will just strengthen us today. Open our eyes. Help us, Lord. I pray your perfect will be done. God will thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We see several phrases and verses in chapter number one. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of thy tears. I'm mindful of thy tears. I, I, I'm aware that you're struggling. I'm aware <clears throat> of the hard time that you're having. He says in verse seven, he says, God does not give the spirit of fear. Now, if he's telling him he don't give the spirit of fear, then that means he's been afraid. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So we have this, this, this minister here that's in the midst of battle. He's in the midst of the war. And we have an old general whose time is almost up. And he's trying to encourage Timothy. And he says, I know you're afraid. I know you are, are struggling. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the tears. And then he says this. He says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. You see, Timothy's timid. Timothy's having stomach issues. Later on, he tells him, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. And, and, and he says, listen, don't be ashamed of me, the prisoner of the Lord. Can y'all see the struggle this young man is having? He's wanting to quit. He's struggling. He's struggling with the false teachers that are there in Ephesus. He's struggling with the great amount of sin that is in Ephesus, the, the cults that are around him. He's struggling and he's having a hard time and he's wanting to quit. He's wanting to quit. You know, they, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a day in the, in the American church where so many people are quitting. So many people are throwing in the towel and so many people are giving up. 
So many of your people are so disillusioned about this whole Christianity thing and they're, they're wondering why things are hard and they're wondering why things are difficult. Let me tell you, because we're in a war. We're in a war. John Stuart Mill, he said war is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degrading state of moral patriotic feeling which thinks that nothing is worth war is much worse. The person who has nothing for which he is willing to fight, nothing which is more important than his own personal safety, is a miserable creature and has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. Right. Is there anything worth fighting for? Are your kids worth fighting for? Is your children, listen, your grandchildren worth fighting for? Is the state of our country worth fighting for? Listen, Winston Churchill in a February 9th, 1941 London broadcast, he said, never, never, never believe any war will be smooth and easy or that anyone who embarks on the strange voyage can measure the tides and the hurricanes he will encounter. The statesman who yields to war fever must realize that once the signal is given, he is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. Here is the answer that I will give to President Roosevelt. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long drawn out trials of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. Man, we need Christians like that today. John MacArthur said this in his commentary. The Christian life is a warfare that as believers we enter in a lifelong fight against the evil world system, Satan and our own sinful flesh. Sadly, much of the, listen now, sadly much of the contemporary church seems to have missed this reality. Many have heard only the gospel of easy believism and cheap grace. They have an inadequate concept of the spiritual struggle involved in loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Such people often magnify the petty temporal annoyances of everyday life until they seem like they are trials of epic proportions. Frankly, that is as absurd as a soldier in the midst of a raging firefight complaining of dirt on his uniform. We're in a battle. We're in a fight. Listen, I was reading of a, a conversation that George Bush, the first one, had in 1990 with Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Some of you remember the situation with Desert Storm and Desert Shield when Iraq went in and invaded Kuwait and the, the nations of the world put an embargo on the the ships coming out of Iraq so they couldn't sell their oil. And so they have a blockade. They have a blockade around so they can't get their ships out. Well, President Bush calls Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and says, listen, we, we know we have a blockade, but we're going to let one of the ships go. We're going to let one of the ships out. And, and Margaret Thatcher listened to him and, and listened to his reasoning and all of that. And she, she began to uh, address him and encourage him. And this is what she said. In the end of the conversation, she says, Now, George, now, George, this is no time to get wobbly. And you know what I think Paul is telling Timothy right here? Timothy, this is no time to get wobbly. I know you're afraid. I know you're struggling. I know things are difficult right now. I know things are hard to handle. But Timothy, this is no time to get wobbly. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know things are fixing to get real bad in our nation, in our country. They've already passed a bill in Minnesota, read it this morning. They passed a bill for trans kids so that a parent cannot disagree and they can, a kid can get a transition and go and have surgery and have, have a, a medication without the parent's consent and the parent has no right to stop it. In our nation, Minnesota, 
Listen, this is, this is not the beginning. Listen, this is not the, this, is, this has been going on. Yeah. They're doing everything they can. This is the battlefield where we're at right now. Yeah. This is where we sit. And we have people who are naive and they've got their head in the sand and they don't realize what's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you this morning, this is no time to get wobbly. Amen. Amen. We are in a war. Paul is reminding Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ. I, I, I've told you before. I've told you before about the funeral. I, my, I did my grandmother's funeral, my mom's mom. And my Aunt Jan was sitting on the front row. My Aunt Jan is a, because she still is a commercial fisherman and, and in her late 70s. And, and commercial fisherman in Lake Okeechobee. And she was sitting there. Uh, she's about 6'1 and can whip any man in this room right now. And I was trying to do my grandmother's funeral. I was in my early 20s, probably 22, 23 years old. And, and man, me and my grandmother was tight and I was broken. And I'm telling you, I walked up there and I couldn't even get my composure and I'm just crying and, and snot slinging and everything. And I'm saying, and Aunt Jen, I'm talking about with a booming voice over the whole congregation. She said, hey boy, buck up. She said, what did you do? I bucked up. I dried up my sniffling and I got to the program. You know what Paul is telling Timothy? I can't hear you. Listen, we're not on a playground. This is not a sandbox that we're in. Paul is an old soldier. I can only, and you may not like old war movies, but I love old war movies and I like, I like, I like them with John Wayne in them and I, I like them all, I'm telling you. And I like General Patton, and I don't recommend that because he cusses a lot, but, but he, he, in, in his situation, I can see the Apostle Paul as a grisly old general who has been in the fight, and he has gone through the trials, and he's gone through the difficulties, and he's seeing a man who is discouraged, even though he loves him, and even though his heart is going out to him, he's wanting to tell him, hey, we're in a war. This is not a fight. This is not a game. The devil plays for Keats. Yes, he does. Buck up, Timothy. This is no time to get wobbly. And he begins to tell him two, two, just a couple of things I want to share with you guys this morning. Number one, I want you to see the reality we face. And I use that word on purpose, reality. Reality. I'm afraid there's so many Christians that are not, they are not in reality. They are in a fantasy world. They think everything's going to be okay and everything's going to be fine and everything's going to be great and as long as everything's smooth, we're fine. And any little ripple in their life, any little difficulty in their life, they just lose their mind. Like God is off the throne or something. And they've forgotten that we are at war. That God said to Satan in the garden that I'm going to put enmity between you and the, your seed and the woman's seed. There is going to be a fight between good and evil. We are at war. Amen. The reality that we face. First of all, if you're taking notes, write this down. We have a fight. We have a fight. A fight. Not a squabble. A fight. Not an argument. A fight. Now, some of y'all ain't never been in one. But if you've ever been in one, you understand this. If you've ever been in a real one, there ain't no rules in a fight. My father taught me a long time ago. He said, son, I don't want you fighting, but I don't want you running neither. If you can't get out of a fight, I want you to deal with the fight and know that there ain't no rules in a fight. You fight to win. You fight to win. My dad has chewed ears off. He's plucked eyes out. Yeah, yeah, that sweet little man waving the cane. Woo-hoo-hoo. Yeah, y'all think he's a sweet little thing. He's been a monster. I said, Dad, how could you bite a man's ear off? He said, it was the closest thing I could get to. And he was beating the devil out of me. He said, son, you got to understand. He says, if you ever get in a fight, there ain't no rules. You fight to get out of the fight. Right, right, right. It's you or him. 
And we've got to understand, we're in a fight. This is real. Satan is after you. He's after your family. He's after your children. He is a killer. We're in a fight. Look at the terminology that Paul uses with Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest, say with me, mightest war, war a good warfare. What does he tell Timothy in chapter 6, verse 12? 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight. Fight. There's no pacifists in God's army. We fight. We are here to fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. When it comes time for him to die, he says, I fought a good fight. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, we're in a fight. We're in a fight. The reality is we're in a fight. We have a fight. Not only do we have a fight, we have a foe. Obviously, if we have a fight, we have a foe. And by the way, it's not each other. And it's not other churches. Listen. Satan's the number one on the list. Peter says it this way. He's very well aware of the tactics of the devil. He says, be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the word adversary means enemy. Your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What are you saying? Satan is actively seeking to destroy you. And so are all his minions. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now see, what Hollywood wants to do is make the devil out as a fairy tale. Hollywood not only wants to make him out as a fairy tale, like he's just like Peter Pan or, or, or whatever the little thing that flies around him. What's her name? Tinkerbell. But it, they, Hollywood has gone beyond that and has tried to soften up Satan. Y'all, y'all have, are aware of a TV show, I think it's called Lucifer. Something of that nature where it's really made the devil the good guy. You think that's an accident? You think that's, you think that's just a... Oh, that's just a Hollywood show. No, it's, in, it's indoctrinating your children who are watching it. So they won't see Satan like he really is. Right. That's right. Satan is a bloodthirsty, lying murderer. Yes, yes, he, is. he is a serial killer. And he's after you. We have an enemy. We have a foe. It's not only Satan, but it's society. It is the world. You remember a few months ago we preached on the world. The world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. What is the world? It's this society. It's the system that we have to live in. It is the system that is God-hating. It's the system that is trying to convince you that the trans lifestyle is normal. That it's normal for a guy. He can be a girl if he wants to be, and a girl can be a guy if he want, if she wants to be. Let me tell you something. That's a lie out of hell. But that's the world we live in. That's the culture we live in. They want to tell you that this book's a fairy tale. They want to tell you this is a made up, that this is no different than, than any other Greek mythology that's out there. 
Do you understand? Do you understand the battlefield that we are in? Where does the battlefield start? The moment you walk out of the doors of this church, you are behind enemy lines. You are behind enemy lines. You are in the enemy's territory. And unfortunately, we not only fight Satan and society, we fight self, our own sinful flesh. Paul says, my, the worst trouble I have is with myself. He said, and look, look it up. He's in Romans. That that I do, I don't want to do. And that that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of flesh? How many of y'all know that some of the hardest struggles we have is with the one in the mirror? We're in a fight. Wake up. Wake up. We're in a fight. The reality we face. Then, then number two. Number two. This is really the message I wanted to get to, but you needed to see why we do what we do. Why, why are we doing these boxes? Why, why are we doing these boxes? Why, why do we have <coughs> tables set up out at the foyer? with a bunch of invites to invite the captives to be free. Yeah. Why are we doing that? Why are we trying to raise money for the missions team to go to the mission field? Why are we, why are we training people to share their faith? Why, why, when I could be taking a nap on Sunday afternoon, I'm with a group of 10 or 12 people training them to go and share their faith and disciple those that they win. On the phone on a regular basis with the people in Chicago, fixing to fly up to Chicago. By the way, Cesar, I need you to go to Chicago with me. <clears throat> Remind me to talk to you about after church. There's a massive group of Hispanics that are, that are in, a, in kind of a limbo and they're needing some direction and, and, and help to train disciples. Why are we doing that? Why are we flying to Detroit? Why would anybody fly to Detroit? <laughs> Pennsylvania, Seattle. Just found out this morning, there's a group of pastors in Alaska Amen. who are wanting to be trained in the summer. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? Because we're at war. We're at war. Look at number two. Don't you see the reminder we find? You see, Paul has to remind Timothy of several things. First of all, he says this, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. First of all, Paul reminds Timothy of his mission. Write that down, his mission. If you don't know it, the Timothy Initiative gets their name. The Timothy Initiative, TTI, is the missions organization that we partner with to plant churches through these boxes and unreached people groups. This is their theme verse. This is where they get their name. All right? Paul is training uh, Timothy or has trained Timothy he said I want you to train some faithful men so that they can do what teach others so we have Paul Timothy faithful men and others four generations of disciple makers what is our mission it's to make disciples it's to make disciples now if that's new to you it shouldn't be if you've been here any amount of time you need to understand that our mission at Temple Baptist is not to do all of the things that this church culture thinks that we're supposed to do and having fellowships and picnics and all. Now we do that stuff because we like to do that stuff, but that's not our mission. Our mission is to develop soldiers. Our mission is to develop disciple-making disciples. And it comes out of this verse. That which thou hast heard of me, Commit thou, the word commit thou, it is the phrase which means to place alongside. 
as Paul placed Timothy alongside of him and served in the mission field, he said, I want you to find faithful men and place them alongside of you that they can teach others also. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying Matthew 28 is our command. It is not a suggestion. It is a command from the captain of our salvation. It is the command from the commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world. Teach them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. What does that word teach mean? Make disciples. Amen. We have training centers right now, 10 or 11 in, in, in action right now here in our city where we're training people to go and make disciples. We're training people to find faithful men, win them to Christ, train them, and send them. That is our mission. That's our mission. That's a command from God. Listen, I don't like that. Well, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong, I'm just telling you right now, you're in the wrong church. If you want it to be anything but that, then you need to go somewhere else because this is our mission. This is what we do. This is what we will do till Jesus comes back. We will sacrifice. We will serve. We will work. We will plant. We will beg. We will borrow. We will do everything we can to make disciples. Because that's our mission. That's our mission. We've commanded by God to go and make disciples. Say that with me. We've been commanded by God to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Listen, he reminds him of his mission. He said, that which I was learned of me. He said, I want you to recruit. I want you to recruit. Now what army, what army is any kind of army without recruitment? We've got to recruit new soldiers. We need to make disciples, win them, train them, send them. Say that with me. Win them, train them, send them. Say it again. Win them, train them, send them. That's our mission. Then we see a mandate. Look in, look in the next verse, verse number three. Thou therefore endure, what's that next word? Hardness. Hardness. Got two verses here that go with this point, our mandate. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness. You know what Paul's saying, Timothy? This ain't going to be easy. This is going to be hard. This is going to be hard because people are not going to be faithful. People are going to abandon you. Matter of fact, matter of fact, if you go read the chapter before, in chapter number one, 2 Timothy chapter number one, you'll find out that Paul said, and I've been doing my soaps. This is amazing. This is amazing. I've been doing my soap study throughout the book of Acts, chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter. And, and it is amazing how the apostle Paul has gone from city to city to city, gone from Philippi to Thessalonica uh, to, to Athens and, and, and to Corinth and all of these places. He's evangelizing and he's winning people to Christ and, and he's training them and he's teaching them. And especially in Ephesus, spent a lot of time in Ephesus where Timothy happens to be right here. And this is what Paul has to say at the end of his life, at the end of his journey, he is about to die. He says, all men have forsaken me. The only one with him at that time was Luke. All the friends he made, all the people that he helped, all the lives that he helped to change. The people that he healed, there were places where people would come up to him and just take handkerchiefs from him. Just, just listen, Paul was so influential and he healed and helped and blessed so many people. But brother Doug, in the end, he was all alone. And he said, Timothy, I'm going to tell you this right now. This is going to be hard. This mission you're on is hard. It's hard. I remember my first night in Bible college. 
My first night in Bible college. Dr. Brown stood in front of all those men. I was the youngest out of all of them. It's crazy. And he looked at him. I'll never forget what he says. He says, if you can do anything else, do it. In other words, if you can be a plumber, if you can be a carpenter, if you can be anything else, if you can be a truck driver, if you can do anything else, I would suggest you do it. You know what he was saying? This is going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. There's been people I've sat by the bed all night long in hospitals with. And, 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 and listen, just day after day after day, spent time with them to help them, encourage them, get through the tragedy they'd gone through for them to turn their back and stab me in the back. Multiple. Multiple. Spend time and think nothing Nothing of it to walk away. Timothy, this is going to be hard. I'm telling you right now, this is not for sissies. Endure hardness. Preacher, this is hard. Okay. I'm going to tell, tell you what, everybody look at me now. I know this is, this is not a shout or out or and it's not one you're going to go call and tell Granny to make sure and check out that second service. I know. I was working with a man doing trim work. And I was working on the, the soffit on the outside trying to it, just make a long story short. I cut it three times and it was still wrong. And I'm getting frustrated and I'm getting mad. I'm just, and I looked at Russell and Russell, you just have to know Russell. He just, just is low key and just down to earth, never gets, I mean, he's just right here all the time. And I'm mad. And I just throw the piece down on the ground. And he looks up at me and I said, this is hard. And he said, well, Malcolm, he said, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Amen. Amen. It's going to be hard. This walk that we're in is hard. This Christian life is hard if you're doing it right. If your Christian walk is easy, you probably ain't doing it right. It's hard. He said we need to avoid. Not only do we endure affliction, but we need to avoid entanglements. Avoid, watch what he says, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You may tell you what's, what's caused many, many Christian soldiers to fall? Other stuff. Not, not necessarily sins. Not adultery. Not, not, not falling into gross immorality. What happened? They just got busy. Everybody look at me now. Everybody look at me. It's going to get tough right here. What's keeping you out of the fight? What hobby do you have? What activity that you have that's keeping you out of the fight? When's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When's the last time you spent time discipling somebody? When's the last time you spent time teaching somebody what you have been taught on Sunday? You think I'm doing this for my breath? I'm training you so you can train others. When's the last time you shared the message that you received? When's the last time you shared the encouragement that you got from God's word and said, hey, let me tell you what I learned. Right. Oh, but preacher, I, I just don't have enough. You know what that means? You're entangled. Well, preacher, you just don't like hobbies. What? I love coon hunting. I love golfing. I love fishing. I, I, listen, I love those things. I, I love snorkeling. I love, I love all that. But the problem is, I can't love that more than Jesus. 
And there's nothing wrong with golfing. There's nothing wrong with hunting. There's nothing wrong with fishing. There's nothing wrong with bowling. Whatever your thing is, it, there ain't nothing wrong with it until it keeps you out of the fight. That's what the word entangled means. He didn't say he ignores all the affairs of life because a brother got to work and pay the bills. Say amen. amen. We got to live. God wants you to live. I, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God doesn't want you not to live, but he don't want your possessions and your things and your activities and your hobbies and all the things you have on your schedule to entangle you, wrap you up so you get out of the fight. There are so many people who are so entangled with stuff and life and things that God has not called them to. Right. And one day I was whining to the Lord. Any of y'all ever whine to the Lord? Yeah. Man, I was just overwhelmed. I'm telling you, I was looking at what I had to get done that week, what I had to get done specifically that day. I said, Lord, I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do how I'm the work. And I mean, I'm just throwing up on the Lord. And I'm giving him this list of 20, uh, 25 things I got to get done. And this is what he said. I'll never forget it. He said, I didn't tell you to do them things. The only thing I told you to do is the thing you're complaining that you don't have time to do. I sat with some preachers. I sat with some preachers who were making excuses about not making disciples. I was sharing with them DMD. Spent several weeks with them. And y'all know I have a very limited amount of patience. And I kept hearing excuse after excuse after excuse. So one day I took the whiteboard. Beware the whiteboard. I said, okay, now let, let's, let's put these things down here on the board right here. Now tell me why you can't do this. And we started writing. If you don't believe me, it is still in the DMD training center right now. I never erased it. I left it up just so I could simmer on it. It's still there. Every excuse they made is still on that board. And this is what I said. And if you go look at the board, not one single responsibility or obligation that they said that we put on that board was biblical. Not one. It was stuff they had to do because their church expected it out of them. But do you realize out of all the expectations that these church people had out of their pastors, not one single one of them was make disciples. Preacher, what's happened? We've created a church culture. We've created a church tradition. And we've got our people and we've got our pastors in America doing everything but making disciples. And I said, listen, are you guys telling me right now? Are you guys telling me right now? That we're so busy with all this stuff, we can't do the one thing God commanded us to do? Brother Doug, that was the last meeting we had. That's the God's truth. Say, preacher, what's happening? I'm telling you what's happening. Satan is not getting you to fall into adultery or immoral sin. He's getting you to be busy. You know what that means? Entangled. Be careful what you put yourself out there to do. Because if it's stopping you from doing the one thing God commanded you to do, you're entangled. And you're going to be a casualty of war. Church, say amen. amen. Listen, number three, last of all. We see our mission, our mandate. Now don't you see our motivation? Our motivation, look what he says. We're going to endure hardness. We're not going to be entangled with things of this life so that, so that we may please him. We may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God picked you. 
God chose you. God recruited you, redeemed you, restored you. Do you want to please him? You ever watch it? Anybody ever been to a ball, ball game with little people? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Been to a little league ball or whatever? You ever notice what them youngins do right before they step into the batter's box? Anybody? What's the first thing they do? Is daddy watching? Is daddy watching? You know why they want to hit that ball? Let me ask you a question. You want to please him? That should be our motivation. Why are you here today? I mean, really? Why, why do you do what you do? Are we men pleasers? Or do we want to please the one who chose us to be a soldier? Listen, our motivation to fight is for the one we're fighting for. Yes. Now, lastly, Paul said this, and this is, this is big, this is big, especially if you're like fighting and, you know, Army stuff and Navy SEAL stuff and all this kind of stuff, yeah. like I do. Yeah. <laughs> There's one thing. I was, I, was meeting, I was meeting with uh, a, a fellow named Tim. He's a Marine. He's retired now. He's pastoring a church in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and, and, but once a Marine, always a Marine. Right. He was involved. He was involved in recovering the body of another Marine that was killed in action that they had taken and buried in a dump. He just had a, he just had a reunion. He just had a reunion with the family of that Marine. They, this, this unit had to go into this, this village, this city, and they had to find somebody, and, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but they had to find somebody to admit where, what they had done. They had drug him through the street, done all this stuff, and then buried him in the dump. And they did not quit until they found who was responsible. Till they got the information and they found the soldier. And they brought that soldier home. And they were not going to quit. They were not going to quit till they recovered that soldier. And man, he's telling me this story and I've got tears dripping off my face and I'm just telling you, I'm ready to sign up and go. <laughs> and, and if you're not feeling that, you probably ain't American. Right. I'm just saying, we can't leave anybody behind. Amen. No Man left behind. And Paul is saying, I do what I do and I suffer what I suffer. He said this, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain the salvation of the Lord. He said, there's too many people out there lost. I've got to fight. They're captives. According to scripture, they are prisoners of war. They are under captivity of Satan. And our mission is to go into the enemy territory and Release them, save them, rescue them. If you knew, I guarantee you, I guarantee you I know this crowd good enough. If you knew that there was a group of soldiers that were being held captive and, and this government needed you, I don't care how much gray hair is on your head, you would sign up right beside me. Let's go get them. Am I right? What's the difference? Why in the world do we need to fill up this box and, and go win people to people we've never seen? Because they're prisoners of war. 
It's what we do. We are the good guys. It's what we do. We are here fighting in a war where there are prisoners that are being held captive and it is our calling, it is our command, it is our commission to go and share the gospel and take them from the grip of Satan who's got them. We're at war. We have our orders. We have a mission. That mission is to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them from... Are y'all with me? Amen. Our mandate is to endure hardness. It's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to throw in the towel. Satan is going to attack on every hand. He's going to attack your health. He's going to attack your finances. He's going to attack your family. But ladies and gentlemen, endure. Hold on. Tough it out. Don't get wobbly. Buck up. Everything's going to be all right. Amen, preacher. Amen, preacher. It will be worth it. Yes, it will. Yes, amen. How do you know? Because one day, one day, we're going to step forward in a, an auditorium like you ain't never seen and we're going to watch our enemy. Listen, we're going to watch Satan bow his knee and he's going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to be worth it. Fight on. Don't quit. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I don't want you to think that I'm just some hard case that just don't understand. I, I trust me. I understand pain. And I understand disappointment. And I understand hurt feelings. I can't tell you how many times my feelings have been hurt, but I have to keep going. And we have to keep on. Why? Because we're in a fight. There are bullets flying. We are in a foxhole. We, are y'all with me? Yes, Suck it up, buttercup. And all God's people say it. 